Hello, yes, that's right. Joe here for Joyrider TV, back live with some more Q&A. Very exciting times, as always. Um, yes, yeah, so here we are, ready to kick off. Um, who's on board already? Uh, Willis is on board. He says, all right, I'm early today. Takes me a half on the head to stay up late. Chose stay up late, took a nap, staying up. Seen a couple of vids on Santa Barbara, Channel Islands. And man, are most of them wrong. And so on. Hello, Willis. <laughs> Thanks for staying up late, man. Um, okay. And um, yeah, so if you do happen to be watching this later on, then this is a pre-record. Well, this is being recorded live. But if you are watching it later, then it will have been pre-recorded. Seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? So if um, you do have any questions later on when you're watching this, if you put your questions into the comments, then what I'll do is either answer it in the comments or put it into the pre-loaded questions for next week. And in fact, any of the videos that I've got on YouTube, you can comment with questions on any of them, and I will put them into the Q&A if, um, if, uh, if you like. So there we go. Hi, Hutchie, how are you doing? Good to have you on board. Um, yeah, so I think, should we just steam in with the first preloaded question? Sorry, I've come in a bit, um, I've come flying in today because I'm quite conscious that I've started six minutes late, and that is, there's no excuse. For that apart from just being late. Hi Nick, how are you doing? Uh, good to have you on board as always. So our first preloaded question comes from Kurosh in Dubai, who says, here we go, um, I was crew with a very advanced sailor during a race on an F-18 C2. We had no more than eight to ten knots and he was working hard to keep the hull flat by asking me to hang on the trapeze between the hull and the spinnaker pole. Um, I think this is worthy of a little drawing to show what Kurosh has been doing on this C2. So this is a view from above. There we go. There's the mast. Spinnaker pole would be something like this, spinnaker chute. And then the position where Kurosh is hanging on the trapeze, you're not going to believe this, sounds like it was, this is obviously not to scale, was here, uh, perhaps hanging on to the spinnaker pole for a bit of stability. I have heard that this is actually a popular technique in the NACRA 15 class. I think that's got to be because of the size and the weight and the distribution of volume of the hulls. But um, continuing on to what Kurosh said after that, uh, to make the boat more efficient, it seemed counterintuitive seeing as he's always tried to keep his bows of a boat of his boat a few fingers above the waterline to reduce the stopping power of the water at the front of the boat. Um, could we talk about that topic? Yes, we can, and we are. Right, so with all of the modern F-18 classes and anything similar, what we've got, all right, is this kind of hull shape. All right, let's try to get this right. Bit of a wobbly, uh, wobbly pen today. All right. Oh, that's pretty good, yeah. Um, does look a bit like a sausage, but... Um, This kind of hull shape, which when we look at it from the front would be, or from the, if we look at it from the top, it's kind of like 
a triangle like that. And then if we look at it from in front, there's the middle. And then the hull is very flat on the bottom, very uh, narrow at the top. All right, so what we have to do in the lighter winds, especially, is we're trying to get it so that um, this flat part of the hull is not going to be riding over every bit of chop as it comes along. So what we have to do is get the weight far enough forwards on a what I would do on a, if I was sailing an F-18, personally, there's the bowsprit, is I would have the crew, if there's the front beam, let's have a back beam as well, um, I would have the crew sitting just forwards of the front beam, and then I would be sitting just behind the back, uh, the front beam. And that would, depending on which type of F-18 it is, um, that would put the weight just slightly forwards of the most voluminous part of the hull, which is going to push the bow just so we're just looking to get the water kind of here so that the tip of the bow is just under the water. The reason that we want to have the tip of the bow just under the water is because the tip, if the tip is above the water, then we're going to have that flat bottom with nothing to have broken the water in front of it. And you're going to get a lot of slapping uh, where the boat is going to be pitched, well, moving up and down quite a lot. Whereas if we've just got the tip in, that's going to break the... Uh, let's say break the surface tension of the water, that found, sounds quite scientific. But what it's also going to do is it's gonna give us a slightly longer waterline length on the hull. So we've got this complete distance from here to here is our waterline. And the longer waterline that we're putting in the water the higher our top speed will be because of how displacement works with, um, with boats. So we're trying to make the boat as long as possible, get the tip in to reduce slapping. And as Kurosh has pointed out just a little bit later there is also in his message is by putting the bow of the boat in more, it's also gonna have a slight effect to the angle of the rig to the wind. So if the boat, if this is our mast, we'll have a bit of mast rake on there. As we're putting the bow of the boat down more, it's bringing the mast more upright, which is gonna be presenting more sail to the wind, making us effectively more powerful. And then as we, um, bring the bow up as it gets windier, it's going to be also bringing the rig back, which is going to be lifting the bow slightly, uh, bringing the rig back, meaning that then um, we're not really trying to goose as much power out of the rig as possible in that situation. So that is what I think on this. And then he said, what is the optimum angle of the boat to be sailing to minimize the loss of energy in water turbulence? Um, well, the way I see it is with pretty much all boats, they're designed to be sailed as flat as possible in a forwards and backwards uh, plane. So where the dagger board is going down, it's going to be very much straight down, as is the rudder. Um, and then if we go crazy angle down at the front, this is continuing, by the way. I hope everybody's still with us here. If we put the bow down hard, what's going to happen is 
the foils are going to come back and they're not going to be giving us as much lift. Um, we're also going to be putting the dagger board further back in relation to the center of effort on the mainsail. So there's definitely a sweet spot that we're trying to find. And um, each boat's sweet spot is going to be slightly different. But I would say definitely getting this point of the bow in the water. Also, another reason why we're not going to go absolutely crazy getting the weight forwards on the upwind is because um, some people, they'll send the crew to the leeward side and then get the crew right up the bow, getting the boat really wheelbarrowing upwind. But what that's also going to do is it's going to bring most of the rudder out of the water as well and we are getting a reasonable amount of lift from the rudders as well so we're getting lift from the dagger boards and the rudders especially with these flat bottom boats where there isn't any hull to stop the boat from slipping sideways and providing lift so that is why we need to stick to this kind of sweet spot so there we go that um, and then of course the opposite is um, if we go too far back, all of these boats, um, most boats I would say with a symmetrical hull, whether it's a skeg hull or a dagger board or center board, um, they all have a much fatter section. The hull is much fatter at the back like this and much more narrow at the front, which um, realistically on a boat like this, right at the front is gonna be kind of like this. So what we're trying to do, but like I've got in the picture here, so that this fat section is free of the water, uh, because if we put that bit in the water, we're gonna create more drag slowing us down we could also if we've got the rudder stock as well um, which could be dragging in the water also so there we go i i think that's as far as i'm going to take that one kurosh i hope you're happy with that as a slight well that's my thinking on this topic so there we go um i think that is a flying start all right let's see who else is on board? We've got Richard on board. Hi, Richard. Thanks for tuning in. We've got HJ from Blackwood Forest, Germany. Happy to chat with you again. Yeah, uh, nice that you could make it. Um, we've got Thomas, also in Germany. Hi, Joe. Nice to see you. It's a holiday feeling. <laughs> Six months to visit Vasiliki. Yeah, the clock is ticking to the next visit. Yeah, um, all being well, we should be open in, uh, well, it will be in about five months now. We'll be open again, ready to start flying the hull across Vasiliki Bay, sending it whooping and cheering, coming back for one of those really cold drinks that we like. Very nice. Hutchie, perfect explanation of trim and different hull shapes. Who thinks you know what you're talking about? No, actually, Hutchie, I am largely making it up. Um, I think most of the stuff that I talk about, I've kind of learned for myself through trial and error and just constant experimentation. And then some things that I've been completely lost on. I have um, asked other sailors, like at events, like at the Tornado Worlds, I did ask quite a lot of questions there. Uh, because we were sailing so slowly and um, it was a real head scratcher. But um, yeah, it's just a, yeah, yeah, there we go. Thank you. All right, Willis, cues, uh, cues, comments are me. I'm just saying, check out our area when you have downtime. There's a lot of cool stuff out here. But you'd have to fly in on a forwards plane 
to LAX or SFO then here. Cool, man. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll book my flight once the dust settles on this situation. Hello, Robin over in, uh, in Florida. Great to have you on board again. Willis says, keep those rudders dug in. Smash for like. It's the thumbs up signal down the middle. Yeah, nice. Right, Robin says, look nice and warm on your ride. It's chilly here in Florida, about 11 degrees. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know if you saw it. It hasn't proved to be a very popular video. I did upload it at a different time. And I know that everybody comes to Joyride TV for their catamaran sailing. Well, there's not much action. I have got this um, burning desire to be putting a bit of action on now and then. And um, yeah, I just went out uh, two days ago on my bike with the 360 camera first time. And the footage was very nice indeed. Um, I was also using the telemetry from telemetry overlay and the Instamic. Um, yeah, the Instamic, I have to say, uh, the customer service at Instamic has been absolutely fantastic. Where um, my original Instamic did uh, fail, I think it had overheated or something. I think I might have, don't know what had happened, but it had stopped working. And I sent it back and immediately they sent me a replacement one. And it is the most convenient way of recording audio when you've got wind noise to contend with, definitely. Not only that, it's really small as well. Look at the size of this bad boy. That, that is the Instamic. Um, yeah, and you can either sync it through Bluetooth to your camera or your phone or whatever you're using, or uh, what I prefer to do is it's also a standalone audio recorder. So it records onto an internal hard drive or internal disk or something. Um, so then after that, to me, because I'm not so trusting of the Bluetooth connections, um, that just makes me feel a little bit more confident that it's going to be there afterwards. But uh, great, great piece. All right, Kurosh says, thanks, Joe. That was a great response. Very clear and illustrative. All right. OK, so um, I think I'm just going to crack on with the next preloaded question, to be honest. Uh, I haven't got so much to go through today unless some questions are going to start coming in let's call it from the floor. Um, this next one is from Transient01, who says, I'm looking at either a Hobie 14 or a Windrush 14 for my first cat. I keep reading that the Hobie 14 isn't as buoyant and is more twitchy, what are its advantages compared to the Windrush? I like it more, and maybe that's all that matters. Yeah, I've been giving this quite a lot of thought because I have, um, uh, most of the time, been uh, definitely championing the Hobie 14, the Hobie 16, as great choices of boat to get started on. Big one of the big reasons for going for one of these boats is there are more of them uh, that have been produced, which means you're more likely to find one in your area at a decent price in good condition than you are to find various other types of boat. But there's no denying that a Hobie 14 is a very, uh, it's, a very quirky, tricky boat to sail until you unlock her secrets. Um, it's the Hobie 14, I would say, on the negative side, can provide so much frustration with stalling the boat um, and not actually being able to get it going forwards, and then problems with tacking the boat as well. and 
The other problem is because of the low volume holes, it's very easy to capsize it forwards, backwards, sideways, every single way, um, which definitely makes the wind rush for a first catamaran seem like a much better choice because the wind rush has got a lot of volume in the hulls, meaning that the, the hulls can basically, um, when we're talking about volume in this context, we're looking at how much weight can the boat carry before it starts going down in the water? Like, um, so this is just really guessing. Let's say the Hobie 14 has got a volume uh, of something like 250 litres. This is a really rough guess. It's probably way out. I'm just trying to compare it to how many windsurfing boards could you get in a Hobie 14? Uh, 250 litres. And then I'd say the Windrush 14 has probably got more like 400, um, which means um, you could, when you're sailing a Hobie 14 um, with perhaps one sailor on there who is 100 kilos, then you're going to have 150 litres of positive buoyancy, buoyancy left to support everything else and to have the boat kind of floating. Whereas on the wind rush, you're gonna have so much more float, it does make it much easier. Um, I don't really know what I'm trying to say here, but the wind rush is going to be easier. But having said that, the 14 is one of the all time classic catamarans. Um, it's also, you could also call it like a modern, Classic, it's withstood the test of time. It's still raced at a very high level um, with big numbers uh, around the world. And it is so quick and it feels fantastic, but you have to unlock her secrets to access those fantastic feelings. Does this sound all right? Um, yeah, so I have done some videos on the technique of sailing the Hobie 14, I still haven't really um, got the hang of it at all. Um, but the difference here, I'd say, is if you'd be quite happy to start off on one boat and then maybe replace that boat after a year or two, then I would say get the wind rush to start with. It's going to be much easier. The sails are less powerful as well. Um, learn to sail on the wind rush maybe you decide that you absolutely love the wind rush no need to change and then um once you've got uh comfortable with the wind rush you could maybe see if there's a 14 that you could try or after a couple of years if one comes up for sale you could just keep looking for that sweet hobie 14 to come up for sale and then buy one have both boats for a little bit, maybe if you if you can afford to uh, use the wind rush when it's really windy and the Hobie 14 when it's a bit less until you start feeling comfortable on the Hobie 14. Uh, and there we go. But the 14 is, uh, it's definitely a cooler boat. And um, the 14 is not only the start, the journey, but it's also the destination of a person's catamaran sailing career. Uh, whereas the Windrush, I would say it goes from the start to the middle. And if you don't have any aspirations to really be um, hitting those really big speeds, it's still quick, but just not as quick. If that made any sense at all, uh, give us a thumbs up. If it didn't, feel free to give us a thumbs down. I'll take those as well. Okay, so thanks very much, Transient01. I hope uh, that helps in some way. All right, so we've got Finn Time Lapse on board. I believe Finn Time Lapse is in Adelaide, Australia, in the middle of the night. So glad that you could make it, Finn. Um, he said, not sure if 
you saw what I said last stream, but the channel has 5 million views. Oh yeah, that is, uh, is, a, is a cup, certainly more than I ever expected. Willis says, I just stumbled across a food eating travel guy with over 8 million subscribers. Blows my mind that I'm so disconnected with the world. Uh, you're on top of my list. Where are the hobies and subscribers? Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's all about how um, popular something is, I suppose. Because if you think about it, everybody likes food. So somebody who travels the world eating nice food, it's going to be quite popular. Whereas the amount of people who are into sailing catamarans, I think, is a reasonably small catchment area of people and also this is this is what i've decided is a major factor with the youtube videos and how many subscribers how many people watch the videos is if somebody's topic is something that is going to attract younger people let's call them millennials um they're going to get masses more views because the younger people are much more likely to kind of be living inside their telephone than slightly older people. Um, I've seen in the um, analytics that my demographic is people between the age of 30 and 65. That's where most of the viewers of Joyrider TV are kind of saddled. And those people are uh, much less likely to be spending that much time uh, watching videos and, and on social media and things. Whereas, uh, like, uh, we, I have got a small boy who has discovered YouTube and he watches a lot of Minecraft videos. And the amount of views on any Minecraft video is mind-blowing. Millions, all of them. So there we go. Um, that is what I think about all of that. OK, so Willis says, you're telling me I need trapeze kit. Shoot. To keep it chill and scuba dive. But you're tempting me to go racing. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Not sure about the context here, Willis. But what I'm saying is. If you've got a boat. Or if you don't trapeze, let's say that you don't trapeze. Sorry, I haven't got many questions, so I'm just going to dig into whatever comes up. Um, if you enjoy your sailing, but you don't yet trapeze, you should never feel that you have to trapeze. Even if it's really windy, with most boats, unless you're extremely lightweight, you can depower the boat enough so that um, it might not be too um, ple pleasant to be out sailing in more than 20 knots of wind without using the trapeze because you're going to get a lot of water in your face. Um, you're going to have to depower a lot, which will feel a bit more like you're fighting the boat. But it is still doable. And I think for most people, most people aren't sailing const uh, consistently in more than 20 knots of wind. I dare say most people are sailing uh, like a really good day would be between eight or 10 knots and 16 knots. That would be perfect conditions for most. Um, and in those conditions, you really don't have to be using the trapeze. If um, even if your skills are really sharp, no trapeze, you could go out just flying the hull. That I find that really, really satisfying and um, it's really nice. Now, should you start looking at going out on the trapeze if you don't already, let's put this in the context of sailing solo, then um, I'd say, yeah, definitely. It is one of the parts of the boat which definitely adds another aspect to the amount of fun that you can get out of the boat. But yes, it will be another aspect to learn. And if you haven't got the gear on the boat already, yes, you're going to need some more gear. So um, 
yeah, I'd say it is worth looking at, but don't let it be that you must trapeze because it's not essential. I think uh, to a lot of people, because we get a lot of people coming here to Wild Wind and it is windy pretty much every day. And sailing the boat, sitting on the trampoline is a lot less intimidating for most than then having to do a bit of balancing act on the side of the boat on the trapeze and controlling the boat from there. So it is a big deal, the helming on the trapeze if you haven't done it before, especially when it starts getting a bit windy. But if you are looking to start with your journey into helming on the trapeze, I would definitely say start in a low wind on a steady course. So get the boat on an upwind point of sail where the boat's nice and stable, loads of space. Uh, ideally, you'd want about 10 knots of wind and then get into that half trapezing position. I'm just going to draw the half trapezing position. All right, so if this is the hull, then we've got the trampoline and the toe strap there. Half trapezing, this is just half trapezing, could be your kind of destination for quite a while. Here is the sailor's leg, sailor's foot under the toe strap, sailor's buttocks over the edge, and then But use it using the trapeze and just hanging in this position. So still very much on the boat, much more stable. Um, but you are getting your weight a bit further out. And then once you've really done as much of that as you can, then it might be time to start thinking about bringing a leg out onto the side of the boat and another leg. But if you start in a light wind, it will be much less intimidating, a lot more stable, a lot easier. So I'd say uh, definitely it is something that, sh that maybe should be on your agenda to at least try it. But it's not like you failed at catamaran sailing if you're not helming on the trapeze. However, if you're going out sailing, taking somebody out, and it's going to be windy, especially if you're taking out somebody reasonably uh, active who's into a bit of um, sport, then to take somebody out and get those guys out on the trapeze while you sit on the boat. Now, that is really how you sell catamaran sailing to somebody who's got no interest in sailing at all. Uh, because even if they're not into sailing, they're going to be into trapezing because everybody who does it is into it immediately. There we go. That's what I think about trapezing. I went into some detail there from not even a question. All right. Let's see where we're up to. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, it's 1.30 in the morning in Adelaide. Um, oh, here we go. Finn says we're uh, back on the analytics of the um, YouTube stuff. He says the analytics can be quite inaccurate because he uses his dad's account, uh, Finn's 13, and most of his friends do too. So there we go. So maybe I am talking to a lot more younger people than I think I am. Uh, who can say? All right, Willis says, Finn, use the scuba system, bring a buddy system and life jacks. Jackets are cool. Don't leave without them. There we go. All right, I've got Tom on board. Hello, Tom. How you doing? Thanks for tuning in. Uh, he says, hi, Joe. Do you prefer a deck sweeper mainsail or a regular mainsail? That's a great question. I would say it's sort of almost like going back to this thing that I've been saying about the trapezing is um, there is no denying that the deck sweeper is quicker. 
Um, the, the reason the deck sweeper is quick, if let's, right, arts and crafts, here we go. So here's one mast. Have we got, can we do this? Yeah. Here's another mast. So in the um, F18 class, this, it started off in the A class and then the F18 class has started doing, if you don't know what we're talking about here, is the mainsail designed has changed quite dramatically. Um, I'm just going to draw the boat in there and here. These are two different boats. So your traditional sail, should I start at the, should I start at the bottom? Yeah. Your traditional sail, we'd have a boom. And then we'd go up like this and then we'd start. All right, not my best picture of a sail, but you know what I'm, all right. In fact, that's, um, that's a bit better. Not much better, but um, yeah. So your traditional sail is definitely what you'd expect, and then we'd have the jib there, and usually eight battens. Um, and everybody was sailing with these sort of sails for a very long time. And then in the last, I suppose it's been about uh, eight years, maybe, the design of the sail has changed somewhat so if you haven't seen this before, this is going to really tickle you. The sail comes right down to the trampoline. Again, not the best picture of a sail, but um, you get the idea. And then we'd have a baton like that. So more like that. So this is what's called a deck sweeper because it really does come down to the deck of the boat. Now you may be wondering, what's the point? Surely it just makes it really difficult to sail the boat. Well, it doesn't make it any easier, that's for sure. So in the comfort of going sailing and everything just being easy, um, the traditional sail is... Um, much nicer to use because like if you've got to go to the leeward side of the boat maybe you need to adjust the dagger board or something or you haven't cleated uh, the jib properly or anything like that it's very easy to move around the boat it's also you've got a lot better view as well uh, for looking under the sail to see if there's other boats there or what have you and um, it's the way it's always been, very easy. Um, and yeah, it's worked for a, a very long, oh, I just saw someone say bottom batten. Bottom batten deck sweepers, high to low outside. Oh, I've got you, yeah. Yeah, beg your pardon, you are, you are uh, yeah, so this bottom batten should be like this way to support this corner here. So that's the bottom batten. And then on the C2, we've also got another batten that goes down there to give that some stability. Um, yeah, it's um, the reason why the deck sweeper is quicker is because we're, we're taking sail area let's say we're taking sail area from here and we're putting it at the bottom. Now, by moving the sail area lower down, what that's doing is it's giving us a lower center of effort, which means that the power that we have on the boat is going to have less of an effect trying to make the boat fly a hull. Because um, it's like being top heavy um, kind of like if you had something with a very, um, what would it be like, uh, a mushroom, which is really big on the top, thin on the bottom, 
quite top heavy, it's more likely to lean over. Whereas something that's smaller on the top uh, and thinner on the, uh, wider on the bottom is gonna be more stable. And it's kind of the same when we're talking about center of effort. So we're moving the center of effort lower down in the sail, which means that the, um, so the center of effort sort of here and on here, generally speaking, a bit higher up, um, which means that the power that we get in the sail is gonna drive the boat forwards more and we're not gonna be dragging extra power towards the top of the sail, which is just having the effect to make the hull lift rather than driving the boat forwards. Um, so in all conditions, pretty much, it does seem very much like the deck sweeper is quicker and more stable as well. Um, we're also putting the sail area over a longer length as well. So the sail is actually higher aspect, which does make it higher lift, lower drag. So it is quicker. And I think one thing which is really nice with the deck sweeper is it just looks so cool out on the water. And I think there's, there's, there's a big, there's a lot to be said for looking cool because um, as we all know, catamaran sailing is um, at least 40% about looking cool. And when you could look a bit cooler, that's uh, definitely worthwhile. All right, and speaking of cool, thin time lapse says, agreed life jackets are cool. I'm not sure if I think this because it's common sense or because my dad is a warrior. Um, no, I, for me, the life jacket or buoyancy aid, um, when I learned to sail, it was definitely, you're not going sailing without a buoyancy aid on. And it's been that ever since. Even if there's no wind at all, the buoyancy aid is on. Sometimes at a regatta, if I'm having to, um, if there's a queue for the slipway and I don't want to have my buoyancy aid on while I'm queuing, I'll, we I'll leave it until I'm actually sat on the boat before I put it on. But whenever I'm sailing, I'll have a buoyancy aid on absolutely without fail. And I, I think that everybody should because it is something that could make a big difference in uh, a sticky situation. Um, Finn also says, and what's a buddy system? And I'll always have to bring a friend. I own a 16. Yeah, I've heard last week, Finn just got a 16. All right, Thomas says, uh, sometimes I wish to have a trapeze on a laser. Yeah, um, definitely one of the things that makes the laser more fun than anything else is that abdominal muscle workout that you get uh, while you're sailing, which could be cured. Uh, with a trapeze. Um, all right, Willis is looking at systems for storage of the scuba gear as I run out and come back in. Safety, if you get buttocks. Hi, I'm still looking forward to someone sponsoring you for radios. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, for sport or kayak, we have great whites here. Seasonally, it's a concern. All right, sorry, I'm just reading the comments, I think. All right, so I'd like to say hello to Eddie. Uh, thanks for pointing that out on the deck sweeper there, Eddie. Um, all right, um, I'm still looking at the comments. There's a bit of a chat going on between Finn and Willis. Okay, yeah, we've got Nick with another good point. Um, um, deck sweeper, but also uh, something that uh, has been thrown about by the people who uh, use them and um, design them and the, the science behind it is where the deck sweeper meets the trampoline, you get what is known as an end plate effect, which is like uh, it does the same thing 
as a winglet, I believe it's called, on uh, the end, this is a aeroplane wing. They all have these little winglets here, um, which uh, prevents any air from spilling from one side to the other side over the end of the wing. And this is doing the same thing, again, making the sail more efficient. So I suppose, I'm just thinking out loud here, with this sort of sail, some of the uh, pressure in the sail is gonna disappear under the bottom. It's just gonna kind of roll off and you're gonna lose those beans from the bottom of the sail. Whereas on the deck sweeper, that can't happen. And uh, that's why there's specific deck sweeper trampolines, which have, I think most of the foiling ACATs are using them. And these deck sweeper trampolines are like solid, like sailcloth, so that the wind can't actually pass through the trampolines. There we go. All right. All right, we've got Max on board in Rosenheim, Germany. Nice to have you on board. We've got Jeff M. Nacra. All good there, not too cold. No, it's not It's not that cold at all, really. Um, we've had some pretty fierce weather, to be honest. I dare say the whole of Europe has been experiencing some pretty fierce weather. But um, at the start of the week, we had um, a significant amount of wind from the south, which brought probably the biggest waves I've ever seen here in all of my years. Um, yeah, very exciting times. Uh, but it's kind of back to normal a bit now. Uh -huh. We've got Bilal in Lagos, Nigeria. Thanks for tuning in. All right. HJ, question. Do you know the tacking angle of a Houghton 16? Are there big differences to other catamarans? Yeah, there will be differences between different boats. Um, the Hobie 16 isn't a particularly uh, high pointing boat because of the um, asymmetric hulls. It's the, the boats which will point the highest. When we're talking about pointing, we're talking about how close will the boat sail to the wind? So if this is the wind, of, of all the boats that we talk about, it's the single hand, single sailed boats with dagger boards, which are gonna point the highest. Because um, on the boats with two sails, the jib is always going to be a slight hindrance to your pointing. Whereas when you've just got a single sail, like on the A-class, you're going to point very close to the wind indeed. So you'll be right up here. Um, we're talking pretty roughly here, of course. And then after that would come the boats with dagger boards. Uh, the double-handed boats would just be a fraction off, just a fraction, small amount off, uh, there, so they'd be your F-18s. And then, then you'd have your skeg hull boats, like, um, let's say like the Dart 18, would just be a fraction. This is all within five degrees, I'd say. The A-class going very high to the wind there. So then we'd have the Dart 18. And then the Hobie 16 would just be a fraction off here. Um, like that. But um, this diagram is by no means accurate in the slightest. But I'd say with a Hobie 16, you should still be getting, you know, roughly about 45 degrees uh, to the wind in my experience. And then the other boats might be just a little bit higher. And as the wind increases, um, everybody is going to be able to point a bit closer to the wind. So it's in the lightest wind 
when we're going to be, regardless of what type of boat you're sailing, in the lighter wind, you're going to be further away from the wind. As the wind increases, you're going to be able to point higher and maintain your uh, boat speed. All right. So, Jeff, top winter here in Hong Kong, passing the 18.3 knots with our NACRA 500. That's becoming interesting. Yeah, great stuff. Um, yeah, that new, the NACRA 500 really does look like a very nice piece of kit. So, I'm sure you're having a good time on that. All right, Willis, we're back on the buoyancy aid here. He says, uh, if you make the, the only decision to remove, I'm paraphrasing here what Willis has said, only reason to remove the buoyancy aid is if you need to swim faster, but otherwise always wear it. The buddy system means you always go out with another person and you both know all the safety things, which will, of course, be coming up on a video, I'm going to start putting the safe, the next safety video together next week. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of feedback on the safety points from uh, that community video that I put out. So thanks very much to everybody for that. All right. So, hey, you've got Chris on board. Hello, Chris. Nice to have you on board nipping in at the end and yeah and chris says if you want to carry a radio on your person a vhf radio a standard horizon such as an hx 890 will suit your needs well yeah we did use standard horizon radios vhf radios here for two years but um we found for our purposes uh I don't know if it was the particular model that we chose, but they just didn't seem quite as durable as the ICOM radios. But I think for personal use, the standard Horizon radios look very nice. Um, OK, so I think we've reached the summit of Mount Q&A here. Um, right, Chris is on the towboat. The 890 allows the use of M. Yeah, so this radio allows the use of MMSI and distress functions. So that really does sound like a very good choice. I think if you are, are I should write this down really for this video. Um, yeah, so the new safety video will be coming out next week. Uh, also coming out soon, we've got Show Us Your Cat, um, the return on Sunday. I've spent a significant amount of time putting that together today. And um, and then next week we'll be having the safety video. And I've got something special I've been cooking up as well, uh, which once I've finished that, we're going to be having that as well. All right. So just before we go, we've got a few more just remarks coming in. Eddie, about the deck sweeper, the old type mainsail, offers more comfort during tacking and jibing. Deck sweeper, you have to stand up, go around the mast, or duck below the sail. Yeah, I didn't even mention the difficulty in getting around the boat with the deck sweeper, but um, it is definitely significant, especially as you get older and perhaps things start seizing up a bit. The gap at the back of the sail where you have to go through as the helmsman it does feel quite small at times. And then if you've got a helmet on with a camera on it, cool, even more difficult. Okay, so we're on the, the safety um, considerations. Robin says, I always take a PLB, personal locator beacon, hooked on to the life jacket. Yeah, I think very sensible. If, you are, if you're sailing without any safety um cover as such i think it really because that technology is so readily available it really makes sense to do everything you can
Okay, so Willis says full EP review is on the table. Put these radios on test and get them sent out to you as a grip full so you can test them out old school style. Hard with shipping though. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so thanks very much. Before you go, if you could just hit the like button. That's all I've got time for today. But thanks very much for joining me. And um, all right. And it's still coming in. Eddie says, for safety, don't forget the knife and the flare. In fact, I don't think we've mentioned uh, flares just yet. No, because uh, I've had a lot of coming in about the safety considerations, but no one talking about the flares. I'm guessing that Eddie is from Holland or Belgium. And I know in those countries, uh, carrying flares on board is definitely something that is a uh, pretty normal practice. And a whistle. Yep. All right. Good guess. All right. So thanks very much. Yeah. Don't forget to hit the like button and I'll see you on Sunday for show us your cat. Otherwise, I'll uh, see you next time with some more. And... All right, so just before I go, Sir Robin SPK, did you ever make a wave jump on a Hobie freestyle stuff? Uh, yeah, I used never never on a Hobie actually, but when I used to sail a Dart 18 um, on the east coast of England, we used to get some big waves. And one of the things I liked to do, because I was young at the time, was to... Uh, See if I could get the rudders out. Great fun. And there's Garibalds, who says, I, uh, how, how is the weather in Vasiliki? I heard that it was bad. Yeah, it's been bad, but um, it comes and it goes. I think we've got the tail end of what is hitting Northern Europe, and even the tail end is pretty juicy. Uh, yeah, we've had a significant amount of wind last week, probably something like 40 to 50 knots overnight. Uh, I think that was on Monday. All right. But I really am going to log off now. Thanks very much for coming. Um, and thanks for so much of your interaction this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are, of course. Thank you very much.